Welcome to Third Eyesight. I'm your host, Juan Francisco, and I'm a spiritual intuitive who practices tarot card reading and mediumship. I've always been super curious about the supernatural and paranormal, and I'm here to share my stories and interview folks who want to share their own stories. Let's get to it. Hey folks, hope you're doing well as you are tuning into this episode, episode 24 of Third Eyesight. Two things before we go into the story of today's episode. So first things first, if you love this podcast or you want to share it with a friend, you can leave a review or leave a star rating depending on the platform you're listening to Third Eyesight on and share it with a friend by copying the link to this episode or copying the link to the podcast page, you know, the way you access the episode or my website, thirdeyesight.media. I would so appreciate that. And I am so grateful for everyone who supports what I do and tells me to keep going and say that they, uh, anyone who says that they enjoy the podcast and listen to it. And if you're listening to this one, thank you for tuning in if it's your first time or if it's your 24th time (laughs) listening to my voice. (laughs) I really, really, really appreciate it. Number two. Something came to my attention recently, and I'd like to talk about it because I feel like it will hit close to home for a lot of people. I was chatting through text with an acquaintance, and uh, they told me that, you know, being in the nursing profession in the last, uh, well, within the last three years, They shared with me after I I told them that I do spiritual development and I work with psychic ability. They shared with me that they used to be a a Christian. And then when the pandemic happened and they saw all the death around them in the hospital, they became atheist slash agnostic. And that got me thinking. It reminded me of my own humanity because I've definitely had moments like that where I just, it's like, how could there be something else out there when all these terrible things are happening, whether to me, to other people, to the planet? And so I wanted to share that here. And I wanted to reassure whoever's listening that more important than believing in something so other people know you believe in something is you being okay, you feeling okay? Or you dealing with grief or anger or sadness in the way that you need to deal with it and, and handle it? However way it suits you, as long as you don't harm yourself or other people in any way, shape, or form. I practice mediumship, as many of you know. I read tarot cards, but mediumship is something quite recent that I picked up. Uh, or I mean, I believe it's I believe it's always there for everybody, but I recently started acknowledging that part of myself last year to 2021. And just because I have channeled the souls of people's loved ones, and sometimes people that the living don't love too much, (laughs) that happens as well. It doesn't mean that just because I practice this, that I believe that, oh, you know, I I now have the key to why terrible things happen to people, why tragedies happen. And it's okay if X, Y, Z happens because there's an afterlife and I feel like I have my own experiential proof for that. Honestly, I practice mediumship, yes. I believe that our soul continues, yes. But... I can't ever explain why a child could be diagnosed with cancer. That's something I don't know if I will ever, 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 ever understand. I can't explain why so many people had to pass on September 11th. I can't explain, well, this goes on and on and on. I will sound like a Debbie Downer if I keep going, but I know that you know that I'm trying to make a point. I feel that I will always have my doubts about things. I will always have my concerns about things that make me feel like I want to take some steps back in regards to my faith in the afterlife. And you know what? If in five or 10 years, I face a tragedy in my life that gets me to a point where I start to truly doubt and I put this all to the side, you know what? 
so be it. And that's not me trying to project anything into the future. It's just me trying to be kind to my future self. And it reminds me not to judge any person who has this struggle. People lose their children. People, sometimes losing an elderly mother, even though some other folks may feel, well, you know, she was 92. People could have any reason they want to have. They're entitled to any reason they want to have for feeling like they can doubt their belief in something. And it's such a personal experience to have, whether you as a child or an elderly parent. Teresa Caputo, whom you all know I love so much if you've looked at my Instagram, and whom you all know I saw in Staten Island in her live show this past weekend, she oftentimes says to people who have lost children, parents are not supposed to bury their children. And when she says that, I recognize that she is acknowledging the seemingly illogical or uh, nonsensical nature there is to losing a child when they're so young or being a parent and having to lay your child to rest. And it doesn't matter. I I really truly believe it doesn't matter how, how great of a medium you are or great of a psychic you are. I We're human. And there will always be moments when we feel like, how can this be? And we may not have the answer to that. And we have to, in a difficult way, learn to accept it. And if we don't ever accept it, it will eat us alive. But that's not for me to... Pass, it's, that doesn't warrant me or anyone else passing any judgment on someone who chooses not to accept something. And that's what this work is for. I feel like as a medium, my purpose is to empower the person I'm speaking to to work on their inner healing and rely less on the things around them for that, re- for that, uh, for that experience. Or to know that their loved ones are at peace. There's one thing I, I've said to folks that I've done readings for where let's say um, they had a parent or a friend or someone that they knew who did them wrong. They felt did them wrong or mistreated them. And it's happened a couple times where I've told the person, listen, your father is on the other side at peace. He does not need you to forgive him. So don't feel pressured to forgive him because they, he, the, the other side, they understand you feel hurt You are not obligated to forgive them. Forgiving is more for you than it is for them. And if you don't forgive them, they understand. And so I do believe that there are things that we will learn on the other side that we will come to understand that as humans, we may not fully understand. And because we don't fully understand them, it leads us to believe, well, if we don't forgive that person, then we will have debts to pay on the other side. Or things like it, it, like why do certain tragedies happen? If they happen this way, there must not be an other side taking care of us. And I fall into that. Often, I do. I'll fully admit it. I, and fall is not even the best word. I feel like that's an insensitive word to use. I, I tend to go in that direction myself. And I want to own up to that because I, I'm human. And why should I not share about my human doubts and my human struggles (laughs) if I'm here, a human with fingers, using this computer to record this podcast? I'm just as human as you, the listener, are. And I do believe that when we get to the other side, we will see the complete picture because time is irrelevant on the other side. So we will see all things happening at once and we will understand why so-and-so happened in this moment in time. But until then... It's okay to struggle and feel like we can't accept something when it's such a tragic thing. And I think the hope that we can depend on is the, is the hope that comes from knowing that our loved ones are at peace and that there is an inner well of healing that we can tap into if we just reach into that inner well and draw from it. Yeah. I'm being reminded right now of Mother Teresa. I remember 
years after Mother Teresa passed, I was a teenager when I saw this news report. They found the diaries of Mother Teresa, and they discovered she doubted the existence of God because of all the poverty she saw in Calcutta and in the communities that she was living in and visiting. And she was known to be a godly woman, quote-unquote godly woman. I do believe she was. But I think when people think of the word godly to describe somebody, they think it's a person of, of firm, firm faith, unshakable faith. But she, Mother Teresa, struggled with her faith because she saw devastation around her and poverty, hunger. It didn't make her any less of a saint. I actually don't know if she was canonized as a saint. I believe she was by the Catholic Church. But let's just use the word saint, you know, capital S, lowercase s, whatever we want, however way we want to use it. It doesn't make her any less of a saint, of a godly woman, because she doubted the existence of something due to the struggles she saw around her. If Mother Teresa could be allowed to have those doubts and continue to be a revered figure in a religion, dude, so can we. So can we. All right. Thank you for listening to my little uh, soapbox moment. I just, I just felt that, that message from that acquaintance of mine, it really struck me. And especially because they went through a, a very difficult time. And I feel like th- th- this pandemic was difficult for so many people and really shook the faith of so many people. And it shook my faith. I'll, I mean, during the pandemic, I discovered or rediscovered rather my intuitive abilities All all at the same time, my faith was being shaken because I couldn't believe what I was seeing on the news, reading in articles, hearing from friends and family. It was just too much. And yet, I am here. And that's good enough for me. And I hope that's good enough for you too. And the fact that you are here listening, regardless of how strong your faith is or how weak it is, that is enough that you are here right now. And you are loved and appreciated, whether you know it or not. Sorry if that was cheesy, but I mean it. I do. All right, now on to story time. So the title of this episode is When I Got Dizzy at a Civil War Fort. Okay, you got dizzy. What, did you like eat a bad sandwich? Like, let's get into it. I have some family in Delaware, and on one of those trips, I decided to go on a very popular paranormal tour of a fort, uh, a a battle fort, a war fort that is in the Delaware River, the same river that President George Washington crossed that is depicted in the famous painting. So I'm going to read you from the website DE, as in Delaware, DEstateparks.com. So here it goes. The state of Delaware deeded Pea Patch Island, located in the Delaware River between Delaware and New Jersey, to the U.S. government in 1813, and construction of Fort Delaware was completed around 1859. Originally built to protect the ports of Wilmington, which is in Delaware, and Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, Pea Patch Island also became a Union prison camp during the Civil War, housing up to as many as 12,000 595 Confederate prisoners of war at one time. For those of you who are overseas, a little break here. For those of you who are overseas and not familiar with U.S. history, the Civil War was a battle between the North, or the Union, and the South, or the Confederates. Okay, here we go, continuing. Manned only briefly during World Wars I and II, the island and fort were finally abandoned and declared surplus property in 1944, when ownership was transferred back to the state of Delaware. Fort Delaware became a state park in 1951. So, all that history in that fort, and there have been many stories about ghost sightings and paranormal activity at the fort, so I assume that inspired them to create these paranormal tours. So I'm going to set the scene for you. It is really cool. So listen up. You get to a town in the mainland part of Delaware, and it's sitting on the Delaware River, and you have to take a ferry. So I'm in the ferry with my family, and the ferry leaves the port, and we are heading towards the island where Fort Delaware 
resides in the middle of the Delaware River in between two mainlands. We're approaching the fort, and we, when we get to it, we disembark from the ferry, and then we hop onto a tram that then drives on this trail going to the fort. It's about a three, two, three-minute ride. And as we're approaching the fort, the sun has just set, so, the, so it's twilight outside. A little bit of sunlight is out, but the sun is not in the, in the sky whatsoever. So we see this fort and all these little lights around to illuminate the grounds because it is a pitch black dark fort. And we arrive at this tent by foot after getting off the tram. And the paranormal team is there giving a brief history of the fort, what to expect, giving us devices that we want to use them, giving us dowsing rods. And dowsing rods are something I want to get for myself. I find them fascinating. We are separated into groups. It's about mm, 30 of us on the tour. Each one has their own individual group to go to certain parts of the, of the fort. And our group goes into the meeting hall. And then the second place we, get, we head into, which is what this story is mainly about, is, well, actually, of course, now I know what it was. But here's how it played out. We enter this room, and the tour guide is in front of our group. And there is another paranormal investigator who runs the tour already in the room we're about to go into. And we're supposed to meet him there so he can tell us a story about the space we are now going to be in. So we enter through the doors from the outside. And there is this uh, semi, uh, it's about a quarter of the length of the whole space. There's a hallway that serves as an entrance hallway. And as soon as I... I'm halfway through that hallway, I get dizzy. I start getting dizzy. And I told my mom, who was with us, I said, Mom, I, I just got dizzy. It's so weird. Like, I got dizzy. Like, I feel, like, sick. Like, I felt like I got sick, but it's only in my head. Like, it's, I only feel the sickness in my head because of the dizziness, but I just feel the sense of being sick or, or like, like uh, queasy or, like, just not feeling all too there i'm not there it's weird i'm not all i'm not, like i'm not all here <laughs> there's something up she goes oh that's weird okay so we're now in the main part of the space we've gone through the hallway and we're in the main space where it opens up into this larger room and there is the second tour person there and he's about to tell us the history of the space we're in within the fort so he said so this space was used for several different things, but we believe it might have been used as an infirmary. So that room you see over there in the middle of the hallway, uh, the, the door in the middle of the hallway that opens up into a small room, we're thinking that might have been where the nurses worked or where there would have been like someone with uh, uh, like bandages or, or medicine or things like that. It's very often that people walk in here, they'll feel sick, they'll feel like they're nauseous, and... <laughs> I look at my mom and I'm like, like, girl, did you hear that? She's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, mm, interesting. So when he opened up the room for questions, I said, I was the first one to talk. Of course, me, <laughs> Mr. Chatty Juan. I said, well, I just want to say when I walked in here, I literally told my mom, like I got dizzy, like out of nowhere. So <laughs> there's definitely something here. So, whew, I don't know. I don't know. It was really bizarre. And the rest of the night, some really fascinating things happened. We entered the kitchen, the kitchen area of the fort, which is known to be the most haunted part. And uh, my sibling had the dowsing rods and was asking questions. And actually, I tried them for a bit, too. And I was asking questions like, uh, do you want men in this kitchen? Because there was a female soul who was known to not want any men in her kitchen when she wasn't living in the physical world and asking her questions was very interesting uh, asking about her life and other souls in the kitchen that used to work there and and those dowsing rods were going in and out in and out based on yes no yes no really really interesting and and you know i have an emf detector and emf detectors can be used for the same thing if an emf detector lights up all the way to red that is really strong energy if you if it's not near a cell phone or an electrical outlet or any kind of electrical wiring and you're in the middle of a room and that happens that's 
pretty bizarre. And if it happens on command, when you ask a question and you say, if it's yes, go all the way to red, and it does it on command more than once, that's extremely compelling. So I've used that before, but dowsing rods, that's quite different. And it's just absolutely fascinating. So if you happen to find yourself in the state of Delaware, which not many people do when they visit the United States, it's a little out of the way, but I happen to have family there, so it makes it easy to visit really cool places because Delaware is actually the first state of the United States of America. The first state to become a state in the United States of America. The nickname of the state is first state. So, go, you know, obvious. If you happen to find yourself there, I highly recommend, and it's usually in October, I believe, maybe November, but I believe it's October when they offer the paranormal investigative tours. It was fascinating. And I always say, if nothing happens on a paranormal investigative tour for you, you at least had the coolest history tour on your trip. Because sometimes things don't happen. It's a boring night and there's no activity on a paranormal tour. But yeah, if you don't get anything, you had the coolest history tour in the coolest way. So I'll leave you with that. Well, thank you for listening to this week's episode. I know it came a day late than usual. I try to post these on Mondays. And just a little reminder, if you want to find me on Instagram, I'm at Juan Third Eye. On Instagram, as well as on Twitter, and on Facebook, you can find me by searching up Juan Francisco, and you'll see the same icon that you see on my Instagram and my Twitter, and you can just go ahead and like that page or follow it. Have a beautiful rest of your week, and thank you so much for listening to Third Eye Sight today. Mm -hmm.